Okay. A little bit of lag. Oh. Okay. Well, we'll have to, we'll see if it um, comes back. So he hello, everyone. This is uh, John Haller. I always wait for a few seconds because I want to make sure that uh, uh, everything is coming through. It looks like we've got sound and we've got a little bit of a lag going on. So if it looks like I say something and Patrick doesn't respond quite away, um, that's because of the lag. <laughs> And, you know, Patrick's out there in the Valley of the Sun, and it's sunny here in Ohio today, bright, clear blue sky. It's also 28 degrees and windy. But, <laughs> uh, and we have a, by the way, in Ohio at my house, we're going to have the uh, the eclipse coming up. So I'll be in the path of totality on April the 8th. And they were forecasting cloudy and rain everywhere that the eclipse was in the Midwest, but now it's clear blue skies is the forecast, long range forecast. So welcome, everyone. I've got Patrick Wood with me. I'm going to be helped out by Pablo Fraschini of Serpents and Doves. Uh, Patrick is publisher of Technocracy News. He's written a couple books. The most recent is The Evil Twins of Transhumanism, Technocracy and Transhumanism. Uh, Patrick and I were talking beforehand about how long we've known each other. And at our age, it's too long to really remember. <laughs> but Patrick, it was a real blessing that I was able to hook up with Patrick. He's come to Fellowship Bible Chapel and done a weekend conference. Uh, I highly recommend his books. He is probably, I think I can say without reservation, in the terms of technocracy, transhumanism, and its historical development, He's certainly one of the leading experts in the world on that. And he's yeah. also an expert on Bible prophecy and how that uh, works. So, Patrick, welcome. You bet. Good to be okay. with you guys. So, Patrick, I said beforehand what we would start off with was sort of your how your understanding of technocracy and transhumanism developed and then sort of start to bring that forward for us. And we'll we'll flesh this out more as we go along. But how did that mm -hmm. how did that whole process develop to uh, you know your understanding and then sort of try to bring it a little bit forward to the day and age of AI. And we'll talk a lot about that as we go through this. So the floor is yours. Have at it. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. You know, I started out uh, studying the Trilateral Commission in the early, uh, mid, and 70s. I hooked up with uh, Professor Anthony Sutton back in that day to chronicle and write about the Tri Trilateral Commission. Um, Sutton was a world-class scholar who had been at Sam Stanford University for several years until they kicked him out. Uh, because he was writing about the Trilateral Commission. And I hooked up in, with him in New Orleans. Uh, strange circumstance, but uh, it happened. And we realized we both had this, uh, were on the same track looking at these people. What We couldn't figure out what was going on exactly. Uh, Sutton had a, a better view than I did probably, but uh, nevertheless, we decided to do a newsletter to write about it we figure is a huge story that nobody else was telling and we had the, the, the chops to do it. So we did. And that's how I got, uh, involved writing uh, ultimately the books, uh, trilaterals over Washington that, that became the de, de facto standard for, uh, the trilateral commission and glo uh, globalization as it was uh, being formed at that point. Uh, still stands. Nobody else has chronicled the Trilateral Commission since, uh, which is astounding to me that they've, they've been able to cover their tracks so well that uh, it's just vir virtually invisible at this point. But uh, I digress. Uh, so that was the foundation of modern globalization period and a subject it's defensible i i will defend this to to the death i've got the the um uh, all this the uh, the research here in my hot little hands <laughs> and uh it is defensible that was the point where modern globalization started 
they wrote about it extensively back in that day. It wasn't me saying, we never said anything. We just looked at what they were saying. That's that I now, still do that today. Are we talking um, back at like in the 1920s so, and 30s back in that time frame? No, I'm talking about the in particular at the found at the founding of the Trilateral Commission by uh, Brzezinski and Rockefeller. Okay, okay. Um, they set a new vision for the world. They said they were going to create a new international economic order. That was all over their literature back then. Nobody knew what they're talking about. We did. We figured out a lot of it. We didn't un understand technocracy. I wish I did, but I at that point I didn't. But they said they were going to create a new international economic order. Well, what does that mean? The people like Rockefeller had all the money in the you know, the bank back then to do it. But, and, and they pulled together people from all over the world. There's never been a, such a, 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 um, a group of people like this um, at that time from Japan and from Europe and North America. Um, the, the fact that they had the money to do it and the people to do it should have been setting off alarm bells everywhere, but it really didn't. Not, we thought it would, but it didn't didn't really work. But um, so I, I'll forward a little bit, go fast forward now a little bit. When their new international economic order was defined, it became, and it's passed off to the United Nations, it became what we know now as G Agenda 21 that came in the Rio de Janeiro conference, the UN conference, UNESCO um, and UNEP, uh, that became the doctrine that they s put forth to create their new international economic order. So that's kind of where we're going to, you know, that was 90, 1992, that was 20 years almost from the founding of the uh, commission. This was their doctrine, period. It was crafted by them. It, the whole thing was written by them. Even, for instance, uh, Gru Harlem Brundtland, who created the, um, the Our Common Future book, that's credited for uh, all of the stuff that happened in Rio. She was the mother of sustainable development. That they said, they even say that to this day. And, you know, all the doctrines, all the stuff that they come up with at that point, this is what we're dealing with today. That we've, we, It's morphing into a scientific dictatorship. And what when you go, go back and look what, Brzezinski wrote in 1970 his book called Between Two, Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. That was the title. He, he saw, well, let me step a, step a little bit back. Um, Ooh, ooh, that's that's ugly. Ooh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I found that picture a long time ago, and I saved that one special because I think that captures the essence of Zbigniew, yeah. Zbigniew Brzezinski, National Security Advisor under Carter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and John's of a, a lot of modern problems. He served uh, under Johnson, too. Right. Oh, he's been around everywhere. And he yeah. Came, yeah. didn't he also come out of Columbia University also? Oh, yeah. He sure did. So, Patrick, right. go ahead. I'll, that, I'll that's leave him up for uh, just a moment, started. just because we look so much better when he's up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, he he wrote this book, and he, fo he uh, looked forward to – and uh, to getting out of the uh, the the age that they were in at that point to a new age in the future, he called the technotronic era. That is a, a synonym for techno technocratic era. It didn't exist back then. 
but they made it ha they made it happen as time went on with rio rio de janeiro especially agenda 21 all the sustainable development nonsense all the energy crisis all of the stuff of the the war on carbon the uh the global warming mantra all that stuff that was their creation to force this new economic order on the world and now we're dealing with this whole business of a scientific dictatorship it's coming out as hot and hairy heavy and people don't see the history of this it, it it's amazing to the it's so simple to understand it really is but people don't want to study it they don't want to read they don't want to look at look at history and they can't understand how we got to where we are today it's very simple if you see the the history of it oh, okay so let's let me just hone in on this now a little bit the same people are still involved with this today as they were back then brzezinski's gone he died a few years ago so rockefeller's gone oh henry kissinger oh praise the lord he's gone <laughs> too <laughs> finally um, that guy hung but, around um, forever <laughs> <laughs> I know he 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 was a hundred hundred years old, yeah. one hundred one when he died. Finally, he wasn't the picture um, of like, but nevertheless, youth and vigor at any point in his life. <laughs> but he hung on forever. And I mean, and David Rock, I mean, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, Brzezinski. David Rockefeller himself lived to a hundred, didn't he? Yeah, well, or one hundred and one. Yes, yes. Yeah, I can't yes, say so, Brzezinski yeah. looks all that better, yeah. anyways. <laughs> So anyway, I interrupted <laughs> I you. Let's go back to the oh. this development of this. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah. So uh, in, in any case, uh, the same people that are at, a part of the co commission today, they're, sto they're totally involved in everything that's going on today. <clears throat> you might have heard the, uh, the, the interview that Tucker Carlson got with... Um, a guy named by Mike Benz. Yep. Oh it yeah, was, absolutely. And actually, it's I had think it's a lot of viewing. I think it may be Tucker's best interview that he ever. Now it may be that he just had one of the most knowledgeable people that he's ever had, but it was it's yes, a phenomenal. Interview. That's right. He and it blew his mind. He never he never saw this coming. <laughs> you know the the stuff. The stuff that we've been talking about all along was on was in Ben's uh, interview, but nobody ever got in front of a camera to express it that way. He the way he did, he did a beautiful job. And however, nobody had a visibility of the trial out of commission in that nobody, and probably even Ben's. But he mentioned two institutions in that uh, interview. One was Aspen Institute, mm -hmm. which originally was Aspen Institute for Humanistic Studies, right? They changed the name several years ago. The other organization was the Atlantic Council. And, you know, Tucker said, wow. Aspen Institute, <laughs> you know, he thought that was a good thing, right? Well, both of these organizations were mentioned in our book, uh, uh, Trilateros Over Washington, in, in 1980, started in uh, 81, in, anyway. These both, both organizations were cesspools for the Trilateral Commission. They were, they weren't started necessarily by them, but they took it over with board the more board members that got uh, inducted there, the money that they gave to these organizations, etc. These were we view those as uh, instruments of trilateral policy, and we have an I sentence gone. I view them today. Oh well, that's you got great. That's Mike there. Ramirez, the um, great editorial I, cartoonist. <laughs> that's his. That's his rest in peace. Kissinger, one on the left, and Zbigniew of Brzezinski on the right. <laughs> two of the major players of the development. So I'll leave him up for a little bit. Yeah. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah. 
So <laughs> that, 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 that eyeball is really uh, piercing. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking at you. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> yeah. So in any case, um, especially the Atlantic Council right now that, uh, that he mentioned in, in this interview, there's been a, a revolving door in their membership uh, of the board, board, of, uh, board of directors membership going all the way back to the founding of the com uh, commission. So these people, these people are driving the train behind the scenes. Nobody talks about the trial auto commission in this way. I'm only, I'm only one. If, if, if you want to, I, when I see somebody and I have, by the way, I have every membership list they ever pr produced and uh, including now I watch these people by a hawk, like, like a hawk because they just somehow always end up in the middle of something and everybody should be scratching their head. How'd they get there? There's only 300 of these people in the world and only like 150 from America. How do these people get in this, these positions? How about, uh, ooh, Anthony Blinton, Blinken, Secretary of State today. I like your slip the there, of the trial Anthony Commission. Blinton, because there's sort of a connection there, but uh, that was an interesting slip of the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> You can't make you can't make this stuff up. It's like they're everywhere. They're everywhere. But what they told us back in the day, because we asked them, well, how you got? How do you guys always get to stack the deck? You know, like with uh, Jimmy Carter's administration, all of his member uh, members of all his cabinet, one except one, were all members of the Trilateral Commission, mm -hmm. and they actually had the audacity to tell me, well. We just uh, we only selected the um, the cream of the crop. Yeah. Well, did leaders, they have you know, intelligent leaders or whatever? I, wasn't Rick Warren a member somehow? Of the, well, naturally, they probably would be the. Yeah. Was Mike? Part. Was Rick Warren a member of the Trilateral Commission also for a while? No, he wasn't. He. he oh, okay. No, he I, wasn't. Maybe he, he was the Council on Foreign uh, Relations. He, Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nobody gets in. Nobody gets invited. Well, there's no application process for the uh, trilateral commission. Never, never has been, and there never will be. You're you're asked to join. Period. And they said that. This is not me saying. Even the, the Brzezinski wrote about that back uh, in the early '70s how how commission how comm commissioners were selected it was a process you'll understand this too you it was a, a process like being tapped for a fraternity when you go go to college or a sorority you know you, you you wait you wait and hope 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 get in that that big one uh, you know and then they're kind of going to come come somebody's going to come up uh, again uh, behind you tap you on the shoulder Come with me. We're gonna take you to Rush Way, Rush mm -hmm. Week, to be inducted. Maybe to be inducted in our club. That's how they did it. They. That's always been the case ever since. So, for instance, when Henry Kissinger, before he died, several years, uh, probably maybe eight years or so before he died, he got chummy chummy with Eric <laughs> Schmitz of Google. And Eric Schmidt was tapped to become a member, and he is today. And he's um, he became the uh, the heir apparent to Henry Kissinger by his Kissinger's only own choice. By the way, they wrote a book together on AI. Believe that, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, okay, so Eric, Eric Schmidt, in any, in any case, he was inducted into the club. That's this is how this is how that works. Yeah. So, um, how mm. is there a relationship between the trilaterals and the Council on Foreign Relations? Is there some little relationship there, or am I? Yes. 
make a connection that I shouldn't make. No, no. Yeah. The, who's the dog and who's the tail? <laughs> um, <laughs> the CFR has been around for a long time, longer than the trial out of commission. But it was all basically the same people in the leadership before, and they then they they uh, formed the uh, trial out of commission. Today, uh, there's a number of uh, like forty percent of the board of directors of the CFI CFR are members of uh, the trial out of commission. Plus. The head of the CFR, CFR is also a member of the Trial Out of Commission. So you tell me who's who's the dog and who who's the tail. So maybe they the CFR is for or the foot years. soldiers. Yeah, they're sort of the foot soldiers for the big committee. Maybe that's maybe that's how that's it works. Right. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Can I jump in here real quick? So what hit, sure. when, when hit, uh, reason why I want to jump in here is because there might be some thinking that this whole <clears throat> movement for technocracy is something recent, maybe within the last few decades. But uh, this goes all the way back to 20s, 30s, Columbia University, um, yes. which, which has always been a cesspool of liberalism and liberal ideology. So uh, <clears throat> I would love... Uh, Pat, if you could at least just take us back and dispel the myth that technocracy is something that uh, was, you know, is something recent, modern history, last 50, 60 years, but it actually mm -hmm. goes yeah. all the way back. Yes. And I think that's really important as well as, and you mentioned yeah. this in your book, really how they go through, there's, there's different pseudonyms used under the guise of technocracy. You mentioned one earlier on, sustainable development is a huge one. They go hand yes. in hand in glove with this whole green movement, the green deal. Uh, you also call it a uh, green economy. And so again, I really think it's important for yeah. everybody that's watching or that is going to be watching to understand that this isn't just, they're not wanting to just take over Techno uh, technology, the area of technology, this encompasses all aspects of of global uh, of the globe, really. So that would be great if you could do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, let's let's go back to Brzezinski, who was a professor of uh, po political science at Columbia University when he wrote this book. And I have to say that the the connection of the Rockefeller family to Columbia goes back to the founding of the organization. It, they've always been close yeah. with Columbia. <clears throat> and it's, it's also, it, I have to say also that uh, when, when it, Columbia has produced horrible stuff over the years, but it's, it's almost misleading to talk to the to talk about them about in, in terms of being liberal or left wing or whatever they're progressives they're 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 a progressive organization from the get go and there's as as progress progressivism uh progressed <laughs> yeah it's split into multiple fingers yeah it, we see it. We see it in the conservative movement as well as the li life left wing yep. crazy movement, and it just permeates everything to, in the church too. Absolutely. So <clears throat> this this idea of progressivism is so dan dangerous today. But in, again, I digress. We'll get back to the subject here. Uh, Columbia University is where this started with um, the Great Depression, with the uh, crash of 29, and uh, people were on the street, they're out of work, they're in soup lines, it was a horrible, horrible time from America. These people at Columbia University, in particular the scientists and, and the engineers, they thought they could do something some better. They, they really thought that they were the, uh, 
the cat's meow. I don't know. They 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 <laughs> horribly uh, steeped up on their own er ego. Yeah, they thought they could do better. So they said we could get together and we make a new economic model for the world to uh, supplant a capitalism and free market economics. That's really crazy talk. To today, you look at people like AOC and the Green New 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 Green Deal, and you think, where'd this come from? Well, yeah. back here in the 1930s, they're saying the same thing. We're gonna we're gonna make everything over and you know free enterprise. Forget it. Capitalism. Forget it. Marxism. Forget it. No, they didn't want any of that stuff. They want a new economic system. So when they coined this whole idea of a new economic system, it was based on resources, resource management, just exactly like we have sustainable development today. Yep. They want to re control all the resources of the world and make them available to people uh, in, a, in a ration sort of a, a way. Well, these people didn't get as much credibility as they wanted back then. Uh, otherwise, it, they would have been, you know, H Hitler would have gotten a hold of it. <laughs> yeah, the world would be different today. Um, but it didn't go very well for them initially. They didn't get any money from the Rockefellers back then, or the Car Carnegies, or the the Kellogg family. Uh, family, they didn't get any any big money from anybody, and that was partly because one of the blowhard. Uh, founders of the movement, Howard Scott, turned to be turned in turned in to, to be a, a con man. And Columbia, he did, didn't have a degree. He didn't even have a, a university degree in engineering. He said he did, but oh, when when uh, when uh, the president Nicholas Butler got at Columbia got wind of that, that was a major scandal for them. <laughs> they 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 dropped those drop kicked out those people out of that so fast it just make their head spin and um so that kind of left a, a mark on technocracy back then you know there was a fraudulent thing they thought and in any case you you don't you don't insult somebody uh like uh like M butler uh at least that not in that day and he felt like he was totally ab abused uh by these people so they didn't Patrick, get any, I, a lot of a lot of can traction. I, However, can and, I just interject something said here? That. Okay. Yes. Finish your thought, and then I want to ask yes. you about another rabbit trail. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you want me to do it now? Go ahead. Okay. So no, no. Um, yeah, I'm going I'm to put up a picture because uh, you we've talked about the Rockefellers. They keep coming up for some reason, and. Uh, so this is, and I and I've been here. Uh, this is the grave of uh, John D. Rockefeller, Sr. in uh, Lakeview Cemetery in Cleveland, Ohio, and I've been there a number of times. It's right next to the Garfield Monument, and it's clear that he was a Freemason, uh, as was Garfield, who also claimed mm -hmm. to be a Christian pastor. But I want to sort of just explore. My understanding is that sort of sister institutions uh, are Columbia University and Union Theological Seminary, which is tied into Riverside Church in New York City. And it was about 100 years ago that Henry Emerson Fosdick went to a big Presbyterian church, I think, on Fifth Avenue and gave a very sp famous speech, sermon, quote, in scare quotes, called Shall the Fundamentalist Win? Um, and it would, it sort of set off the conflict within the church between these progressives and the fundamentalists led by J. Gresham Machen and, and some other people. But Union Theological Seminary also seems to be tied into this a little bit. And that, by the way, that's where um, hmm. Dietrich Bonhoeffer went to seminary. And Bonhoeffer had major theological problems, despite what the famous book on Bonhoeffer by Eric Metaxas says. He was probably a heretic. I doubt that he was saved. But 
Uh, that's a different topic for a different time. But <laughs> did they? It, was it through Union Theological Seminary and other seminaries that they tried to tie in the religious aspect of this with this whole progressive technocratic movement? Oh yes. Oh, totally. Okay. You know, it's <clears throat> it's interesting to look at all of the major uh, denominations and. Uh, even even Bible churches, at the evangelical churches at this point, they, they've fallen into this trap. And it's been so subtle uh, along the way, I'm sure. But um, uh, for, for instance, the, the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, uh, the uh, uh, Presbyterian Church, the uh, Catholic Church, uh, the, all the other churches as well, They've all gone green, all of them. I wrote about this uh, seven, eight years ago, and that um, they've they've all picked up this a, a green agenda, and now you have even uh, even the Pope is is yeah. you know his his tunic is turned green <laughs> in my in my eyes i see a green glowing you know yeah. hope now laudato um, si or whatever this is not by it, mistake yeah. well but yes, this is really exactly. understands yeah. that what we're seeing today this has been going on for a hundred years yeah exactly in, in theological service search sur, uh, yes. circles yes. and <laughs> in academic yes. circles and in government circles and then you know we won't even i don't think we have time to discuss the the dulles brothers and their influence on this whole situation as well but anyway patrick go back to what you were talking about because well here's uh, here here's when 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 the thread when we took take the thread forward brzezinski as a at, at columbia university brzezinski picked up this this idea from the professors who were still there at the university. They, were, they weren't allowed to talk about it. There was reasons for it. They couldn't talk about it openly, but it was clear that he got, the, he got this message from these other professors along the way. And he this is what he incorporated into his book, Between Two Ages. Yeah. When <clears throat> Rockefeller saw that book, that rang the bell for Rockefeller period, because this was going to be adopted as his new international economic order that he was going to put on the world. It only, it only found utility, in other words, when Rockefeller got his hands on it. And has he brought other people around him in the world uh, from North America, Japan, and, the, and Europe, to frame this whole thing, they did it in terms of technocratic thinking. Yeah. Period. Uh, let me give you an example. Exact. This is perfect. We're, we're dealing with China today, big time. China was brought into this, uh, the global stage by Zbigniew Brzezinski. Everybody and literature will tell you that it was his singular effort that brought Chairman Deng to the United States to wine him and dine him and bring him then into the, the and China onto the global stage. <clears throat> this was a, a, a trilateral commission project to bring China into modern society. They their their economy looked like North Korea at that point, but they didn't have it. They couldn't do anything right. They they knew how to kill their people, but they couldn't do anything right. When Brzezinski brought him to America, do you think Brzezinski taught talk, taught him about capitalism and free market <clears throat> economics, free enterprise? No, not at all. He taught them about technocracy for a resource-based engineered economic system. That's exactly what we have today in China. They've, 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 uh, they picked up the, the they were a, a blank state slate. They picked up that doctrine and it just suited them perfectly. 
because they had no other thing to to weigh them weigh them down. So hey, what what we'll just try this. It worked perfectly for them. By the year two thousand, Time Magazine. That's what that was one of the original uh, media people that w uh, joined uh, the commission back in that day. Um, they said that uh, China wrote it. And you, you get the article is still on online. It's called "The Revenge of the Nerds" in Ch about China, but in that said they said China has become a technocracy. They they gave gave the history of uh, what happened in the 30s with technocracy at U Columbia University. And the whole line, nine yards, they said China has now become a technocracy. But nobody acknowledged that at the time, and they still don't. Oh, you know, they talk, talk about the Chai Coms or whatever, you know, China's Communist Party. That's not where they are today. They're, they're, they have morphed into a technocracy. This is how these people have worked. They, you know, when he, Brzezinski's role, just didn't start as a uh, national or, or stop with uh, the fact that he was uh, Carter's NSA. And it just didn't stop with uh, one meal or one whatever. He set the course for their education to everything technocracy. And also at that point in time, as even as uh, Brzezinski was normalizing relations with China, with the chairman, his name was Deng Xiaoping, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, even as they were doing that, trilateral organizations like Bechtel Corporation from San Francisco, private the largest private engineering company in the world. Back then, it's probably still this today. Bechtel Corporation had already been to China illegally, completely illegal for that to, to do something like that uh, that day, but they had already completed 18 major infrastructure pot projects in China even as Brzezinski was talking to Deng at that time at that table. Well, just hope so, so happens that the, the head of um, Bechtel was a member of the Trilateral Commission. Oh, that's, oh, that's you know, a big show. Yeah. <laughs> just you can't make us up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Patrick, so they when were we already over there building up the infrastructure. So when we when we bring forward to a recent example, I think it was last year, Xi Jinping, I forget what what organization it was, he went and gave a speech in front of, I don't know, was it four hundred or four thousand tech executives, Xi Jinping, the head of China, and these technocrats, for lack of a better term, stood up and gave him a standing ovation. I was in San Francisco last year and it's like it, it this <laughs> is just an outgrowth of all of this stuff that kissinger and brzezinski yeah. yes. and nixon and carter started with uh communist china right yeah okay yeah can i up, can I, that, up, up until that point everything everything in the old order just changed at that point in history, we we need to see this as the this is the focal point we need to look at to figure out from what was old to what was new. China was morphed. the The object of these people was um, to do something new. Everything they did before that failed. They they acknowledged that in writing, by the way. Um, and they said, we need to do something new. That's why that's Richard, Richard Gardner, uh, a member of the commission wrote in for, uh, foreign affairs magazine, an article called the hard road to uh, world order. And by the way, 
That's the, the title of my book, the second book on technocracy right there. That's in art honor of uh, his article, <laughs> The Hard Road to uh, Global or Order, uh, World Order, excuse me. Um, he said, we need to do an end run around national sovereignty. We, we have to forget the frontal attack, which he, he said that we tried that before. It didn't work for us. So we need to do a, a, something different. We need to do a, a, an end run around national sovereignty to get the job done, to reform the world into this new economic system. They, they clearly said this something had happened at that point in their thinking. They, they scrapped everything that happened before that. And now he said, now we're going to do this new thing, new tent. And here we are today with sustainable development, a green new deal, green economy, circular economy, blah, 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 on and on. <laughs> and you wonder what happened? Well, it's not, you just, it's not too hard to figure it. But here's, the, let me put a layer on this. It was all, is always about, resource capture from the get-go we need to we need to remember that was the con that this put that these people put on us they were apt they after they wanted to create a situation where they get all the resources of the world into their pocket that's what this is all about this was what sustainable development is all about is capturing the resources of the world take them take them away from you and me and anybody else and uh, make sure that you don't have any wealth from it. And now you look at somebody like Klaus Schwab, who told us two years ago or three years ago now, that by 2030, you will know, you will no, own nothing and be happy. Well, oh, so we have, we own stuff now, but in a few short years, we're going to own nothing. And we're going to be happy. We're certainly not going to be happy. But he made a, a prophecy here and he flipped this, flipped it in a, in our face. And everybody, oh, you silly old man. <laughs> you know, I don't know what people are thinking. But this, he really means it. This was what they were headed towards from the get-go. Right. Resource you know, capture. That's always been the plan is to get all the resources into their pocket and deny us everything else. It's interesting. Back in 2019, the last uh, in my legal career seminar, le continuing legal education seminar I went to, I, we were in California. So I'm going to run up to San Francisco and go to this one at the Practicing Law Institute. It's an excellent legal uh, education organization. But the title of the seminar was The Internet of Things, and the presenters were all of these corporate councils, high-faluting technology, uh, law firm council, corporate council from the big uh, tech companies, the Magnificent Seven or whatever we call them now. And the, the overarching theme of that conference for two days was the internet of things and how we're not really, this was before Klaus Schwab made his speech in 2020. This was a, yes. almost a year before that. And they were talking about, you're going to rent everything. You're, you're not going to have to own anything. And, you know, that's when I, I think that's the, I, I actually yes. downloaded Uber while I was in San Francisco and used the app to get around to restaurants at night and that type of thing. And I, I guess I never really, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this and it just, when, when you're looking at this and you, you, and I know you, I've known you for a long time, you've been here at church and I've talked to other people who've been talking about this and I've read books. And when you're sitting there in a room with all of these people who it's like part of their nature, you, it's, it's hard to pick up on it, I think. So that's my personal testimony of being ignorant, even when I have knowledge. <laughs> Let, <clears throat> I want to jump in here real oh, quick <laughs> because, uh, again, one of the reasons why I think it's so important for us to go all the way back to where uh, the roots of all this started is because they were very vocal about it 
even back then. So you mentioned Klaus Schwab, WEF, right? Everybody knows the quote, you'll own nothing and you're going to be happy. But that's not something that is a new idea when it comes to technocracy, when it comes to this ideology. You wrote, let me do a little plug for your book, folks. I highly encourage you to get Pat's book because everything we're talking about is actually in this book. It's it's a fabulous book. He lays it out really good. Yeah. In the book, um, there's two things I want to I, I would love for you to get to. So give me a second to land the plane. One of the things you talk about is Henry Porter back in 1932 when he wrote his book, Roosevelt and Technocracy. And this is one of the things he said, and I think people are going to pick up on this notion. He said, quote, in any national crises, individualism must be submerged. I hope everybody understood and caught that. Individualism must be submerged. We must all unite on a basis of, this is a word we hear a lot now, but it's not new, on the basis of equality. Surely we're not too hidebound to move forward courageously to an effective unconventional re reconstruction offer wealth and of our wealth and resources. So um, this is this has been going on a long, long time. The whole move, uh, one thing that it seems to me, uh, it didn't stop there. You guys talked a lot about Brzezinski because he's a big player here. And you talked about his book uh, that he wrote. Um, it was called uh, Between Two Ages. And the whole point of his book, again, was America's role in the age, right? The technocratic age and era. And I want to quote this. I'm going to throw this back to you real quick because I want people to see how back in 32 with Porter, this was, uh, he wrote this book, I think, what, uh, Pat, when did he write Two Ages? 70s, uh, late 70s, somewhere around there? In the 70s. Okay. <clears throat> yes. yes. And this is what uh, he said. It. Yeah. He said, more directly linked to the impact of technology, it involves a gradual appearance of a more controlled, directed society, such as a society would be dominated by an elite, an elite, whose claim to political power will rest on allegedly superior scientific know-how. And this was interesting to me. Unhindered by restraints of traditional liberal values, this elite would not hesitate to achieve its political ends by using the latest modern technique techniques for influencing public behavior and keeping society under close surveillance and control. So I want to throw this back to you. You know, people are probably wondering, well, why the history lesson? I think it's important if we don't understand where these people are coming from, what the ideology is, what the end goal is, which they're very close to. You mentioned that in your book too, which they got close in 2015. They got close in 2018. They're almost there. Uh, it This isn't something new, Pat. Talk to us about this whole movement, technocracy, when you boil it down to control every aspect of society. Exactly right. Exactly right. My friend, uh, late friend, Rosa Corey, uh, would often uh, end his, her uh, speeches with something like um, the uh, the idea is to control every uh, widget that gets made, everything that goes into your mouth, everything that comes out, every activity of human act that humans can do, everything is in uh, view with these people to control. The more that they can dial into it, the more they control. The data is control, is the, the idea here. It, you can't, if you want to collect data on something, the only reason you do it is to control. Whatever the object of collection is, you want to control it you, to collect data on it. This is why there's a, been a bum's rush on collecting all the data in the world. Yeah. <clears throat> that's how they're that's how they can figure out how to control us you know another interesting thing back in the day in the 30s they said they they um they used this in the definition of their movement they started out by saying it is the the science 
of social engineering. Yeah. And you say, well, why does that, what does that have to do with sustainable development or some, you know, resource management? Well, they can build their factories. Factories are easy to, for an engineer to build one that works. You got pulleys and gears and whatever, you know, uh, but the people that work in those factories, they don't act the so, you know, they got, they want breaks. They want, you know, I guess sick. They got bad attitude, whatever. They want to strike. Uh, they can't control people. They found out that the way they wanted to control all the machinery of society. So they, they launched into this idea of turning social engineering into a science that of course is not a science right it really isn't a pseudoscience at the at best otherwise it's just a con but this has been a major major thing all these years with all the propaganda and the social you know by the way we're going to segue into ai right now yeah yeah because ai is the the epitome of social engineering at this point. So, you know, they, they thought, well, okay, we have to con control the people who, who work in our perfect factories. <laughs> and the his, you know, you have to think too, this was the day back then where BF Skinner was doing his experiments with dogs and other animals. And other social things like, you know, experiments going on. They misread this whole thing. People are not human. Humans are not dogs. Yeah. They're not just animals. Although they thought that we're just animals. But we know better. But they didn't know that. So, you know, they could just make us drool whenever, when they ring the bell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, can I? All I have to do is conditioning. Let me let me again jump in here, John. If that's okay with you, just no, because anytime, um, Bob. Really, go ahead. So, Pat, you yeah. just talked about uh, collecting data on the masses because their ultimate control. I mean, their ultimate goal is control of society. I mean, I just read some of the quotes back from Porter in the '30s, and then Brzezinski, but. Uh, one thing that I find really interesting, and again, you just mentioned AI. So a uh, good friend of the ministry, dear friend of mine, I love him like a brother, Ron. I've mentioned him a bunch of times. Ron also, um, he uh, he writes blogs for the ministry as well. But uh, for those that don't know who Ron is, Ron uh, is now a retired uh, special. He, he retired from the FBI as an agent. And we've had this conversation many times. He said when he started uh, in a specific department with the Bureau, I think it was back in 1990, no, 2000, 2006 or seven, somewhere around there, um, even earlier, they were collecting one gig, one gigabyte of information on people. By the time he retired in 2000, I believe it was 2017 from that specific department, they were con they were uh, uh, collecting in excess of petabytes, which is, I think a petabyte is 1,000 terabytes. So in just and a, a terabyte few- terabyte is 1,000 gigabytes. 1,000 gigabytes. So, so uh, the progression in a, sh in a few short years, and I'll land the plane in a second here, but I think it's important people understand yeah. the enormity of where this is headed. So in the mid-2000s, we were at a gigabyte, and in just a few years, uh, they went from a gigabyte, skipped over terabytes, and went to petabytes. So- um, you're talking two thousand times. So the the problem is the problem is processing <laughs> power, processing power. And so here we have all of this information. John, you've talked about the Facebook data banks and the Google data banks. You have some of those uh, data farms in your own backyard. And so we have these data farms not only in our country, all around the world, but we don't have the processing power. And where I'm coming from is here, here is, and, and I'll be eventually talking about this, is the marriage between 
quantum computing and artificial intelligence. That is the union of unions uh, that every technocrat in the world is salivating over because once that two, once those two come together, they'll be able to not only process all of that information in a matter of seconds. I mean, we we don't. I don't know if we're going to have time to even get into. Um, them being able to decrypt, and encryption is something big too within technocracy. They'll be able to decrypt. So, Pat, uh, you mentioned AI and this this whole notion of of control, but I don't think people understand. Talk to us about how close. Again, you mentioned it in your book. How close they are to getting mm -hmm. their dreams come true. Go ahead, John. Well, let me get let me just add a little bit to that question because I already had the question come up or comment come up early before we even started chatting that, you know, well, I don't believe in AI. It's not that big a deal. It makes <laughs> stupid mistakes right now. So why should we even bother worrying worrying about it? This is all just a bunch of fear mongering and hype. Patrick, what say you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. When I had my stroke uh, last year, uh, the Lord did a, well, he gave me a lot of things to think about. <laughs> when you can't write, you you know, you can't speak, uh, you, you have to do all this therapy and stuff. I didn't have anybody to, con you know, really to talk about or talk to. You just think about stuff. Uh, all the stuff that I had in my mind at that point, I had two books, uh, actually three books behind me on technocracy. And I, I wanted to, you know, kind of wrestle through well, what is, what does it mean? Where are we headed here? One of the major, major things that I took out of that episode of my life that, uh, that I, I believe really believe the Lord just kind of gave, gave in me this thought. And I'll, uh, I believe it's defensible at this point. That is, <clears throat> what we're facing today in the world and in America, for Christians and non-Christians alike, is the collapse of reality as we know it, period. Yep. The collapse of reality as we know it. There's lots of thoughts around this. I'm not, I can't have, uh, don't have time to go at it all right now, but AI, AI in particular will be the, uh, the Canon, uh, Ram that stick, you know, puts the fodder down the barrel, whatever, to blow the world up as far as reality is concerned. Yeah. There's going to be a time where you will not know what is real and what is not real. You'll be, it, it'll be like you're living in um, the Matrix movie. You're walking the street, but you have no clue what's going on behind. You're, you're being manipulated, but you can't see who, how, where, why. And this reality, I believe, will usher in this new age of uh, total scientific dictatorship where people can be, the whole herd of humanity will be manipulated as a, ter as a herd. The problem here for people listening to this, who I, I wanted, I, I want, I don't want to scare the pants off of you, but <laughs> for those who care, <laughs> some, some people won't care they still got their their iphone their likes or whatever yeah. you know some people won't care but for those who do want to who do care do no i don't want to slip into some other all alternate uh, universe or something you know there if you want to stay in touch with reality you're going to have to do some things right now to, to protect yourself one is if you're a christian you better get in to the word of God in Amen. a way that you've never been in before. Amen. And secondly, you need to be in touch with people again. You need to re reconnect with whoever you can, a like like binded people, to build yourself community where you can relate to people about the realities of life 
and not be sucked into this, this, this all this, this, this other stuff. There are things coming down the pike right now with, at, with AI that nobody is, in my opinion, nobody is going to understand it until it hits them. That's right. That's feature right. feature feature length movies will be created by AI and you will not be able to tell that not the people the actors are not real at all it's all generated by AI you will not know who where s stories are written or generated from or even if your newscaster is a image uh, gener generated by AI um, there's other things that um, will be used to nudge you. That nudge is a, a, a technical term in propaganda. Uh, like this next ex as election, for instance, Google is a master of this, to present you with information, maybe synth synthetic or not, but uh, they'll present you with in uh, information that will nudge you to a preconceived conclusion and you'll never know how you got there. <laughs> Some people are saying right now, even the, in people in the industry are saying there will be no more, uh, uh, no more elections after this next one. Yeah. So, you know what? You um, know, we're, we're in it some tough times right now. You, uh, John, am I able to share down here? Present? You uh, should be I able won't... to share, yeah. Okay, yeah. let me go ahead and jump in here real quick because, uh, let me see, share screen. Um, let me see, which one do I want to share? There it is. All right. Um, I think it's really important for, for folks to understand and see what, uh, let me see, how do I share this? You have to click on... Uh click on the screen when you get like doing the entire window, the program. Yep. All right. So, so it give it, you that option. Okay. So hopefully I could do this um, and, and share. I've got the screen here. Not sure why it's not letting me share it, but whatever. Oh, there How about we go. That? Okay. I have to click on it. There Sorry we go. About that. So I did, uh, I think my second to last, well, my live, the last live I did, which was a pop-up live, I talked about the dangers of AI. And Pat, uh, you did a, a great job at explaining that right now. But I think there are still those doubters out there that would say, no, there is no way we're anywhere near that. And I probably would have said maybe a year ago that it still has a long way to go. But with the advent of Sora and a few <laughs> others, um, I think it's important, and I would encourage people to go check out Sora, OpenAI Sora, Sam, Sam Altman. I believe Sam Altman's another technocrat, um, <clears throat> big time. But for those that might be wondering, well, are we really there yet? Um, yeah, we're, we're actually at a point right now where, um, and I don't understand why this isn't showing it, but let me see if I refresh this, if it'll work. There we go. Um, this video right here is yeah, solely yeah. created by AI. And yeah, I'm sure if you look around, there's some, you know, things that would give it away like this person here. But if I just scroll through here and show you what things, uh, what they could do via AI, all of this is AI generated video. Every last bit of this. If I showed this to you, you probably wouldn't know the difference. You wouldn't be able right. to tell me that that's not really Big Sur. Uh, you wouldn't be able to tell me that um, that is not a real bird. But this is all AI. And what I'm getting Go to at, the next one. That's kind sure. of interesting. The, the naval battle and a cup of coffee. Yeah. There you go. That's that's generated by <laughs> AI as well. Yeah. Um, uh, this one right here. Now, again, if you don't know what to look for, if I, you know, I pointed out the the length of this of the fingers here is a dead giveaway. Um, but they will perfect this in a short amount of time. Uh, yeah, these are baby steps right now. Yeah, I these, used this one last Sunday, Pablo, and somebody said there's a satellite dish in, on a on one of these old West uh, houses in California gold rush time. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't see it, but. Uh, and, and well, obviously we didn't have drones back then. You know what I right, mean? So right. we wouldn't have the drone footage, but 
Uh, I think the point that Pat you're making is the uh, what if they want to revise history and they can do that. And I believe that uh, people now all, all they right. rely on is this right here, their phones and Google. I'll just ask Google. And if you don't know your history well, and the reason why I'm scrolling through here is you will not know the difference. You are not going to know the difference. This again here is all AI. And and John, I'm glad you pointed this out. The fact that these right here, what you're seeing, folks, these are baby steps. This is, but we came in just one year. We came from that pathetic video of Will Smith, you know, looking like he's eating spaghetti, which was ridiculous, to this right here. And I have to say that open AI, again, look at the reflection here. Uh, this is video. Did you see a reflection of the gal there every time it passed uh, one of the uh, the bridge posts? Mm -hmm. This looks, if I showed this to you folks, you wouldn't know the difference. You would think this is real, but this is AI generated. So and Patrick, it, you, you mentioned the quantum computing, uh, Pablo, you mentioned it well. Uh, and I'm looking at some of the developments in AI and that type of thing. And um they're they're increasing their abilities, you know, in a very short time, like a thousand times more than they could two months ago. And so you have a couple thousand times increases and then all of a sudden you're at a million times, but then you put in quantum commute computing and then everything's off the chart. And Patrick, how how close do you think they're coming into this quantum computing uh, thing that's really going to make encryption it, it's going to change everything. It's oh, going yeah. to change reality, as yep. you said. <clears throat> if, if, even if a quantum computing doesn't figure into artificial intelligence for now, there, there's plenty of uh, technology that, uh, that can run the algorithms today. Um, even, even if qu quantum computer computing is uh factored in uh, ibm's do, done a, lots of uh, lots of advancements here um it still have has problems yeah. with it and the, the probably a ai will figure out how to solve those problems in the end but there's uh uh it's, it's good for some some things but not for running ai algorithms at this point um It'll probably be a blended uh, thing at some point, where uh, quantum computers can you you know bring in uh, some horsepower for certain tasks, but not for the whole thing. Sam Altman just announced um, a few couple of weeks ago that he wants to build a new class of uh, chips to process AI. He, he calls for, a get this, a fund of $7 trillion to do this. That's inconceivable in, in today's economy. Yeah. What's he talking about? Why the urgency? $7 trillion to new, you know, to, for chip development? What's he, what's, what is, what is he sitting on right now? Perhaps he's they, they they might even have uh, you know the uh, uh, what they call artificial gel, general intelligence at this point, where it will use this new technology or need this new technology to to work correctly. Then beyond that, the the next thing is then what they call um, artificial super intelligence. That's a whole nother level where computers will, uh, where well, not just the hardware, but the algorithms will take on literally God-like qualities. Uh, where <laughs> I'll tell you what, I see this hum coming, where AI will be worshipped as God. Oh yeah, finally. Yeah. In the end. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. By we the see way, the, just the Church of AI already on the mm -hmm. internet, uh, and it, worship God as uh, AI as a God. This you can see how people can fall into this trap where what it knows everything, 
and knows everything about me, it, <laughs> and it can give me anything I want or need or whatever, maybe a good spanking too, you know, <laughs> but let, let me, this is, this is the world where we're, let, let me just jump in there real quick, because I think it's important uh, for people to understand we're not too far off when it comes to quantum computing. And the way that quantum computing works is it, again, it's hardware, it's not software. So AI is the software yes. quantum compute quantum computing <laughs> is the hardware and the challenge that they've been facing with quantum computing is how to get the qubits, which is what uh, the quantum computer works off of. And I think the largest one right now uh, sits at a thousand qubits, which is big. But the problem they have is stability, is trying yes. to stabilize the qubits at room temperature because these qubits, because they work on a subatomic level, the qubits, um, they're affected by light, any shift in light, any shift in temperature, any shift in dust. And so they have to be kept like sealed tight. Uh, and so one of the big things that just came out, I think it was just a month or two months ago, um, was they said that they have the ability. There was a study done, uh, Professor Kiyoshi Miyata from Kyushu University another professor too reports that they've achieved quantum coherence at room temperature and to some that might be like what what that that sounds like a bunch of gibberish but it's huge um it's huge it's almost think about it this way you could have your computer sitting on your desktop or you could hold it in your hand without anything affecting the performance of the the chip the processing chip inside well, they're trying to get quantum computing to do the same thing, which is work and function, have the qubits work and function at room temperature without any interference from the light, from the dust, from the temperature. And they are very, very close to accomplishing this. And when that happens, not if, when that happens, again, it's going to be a total game changer, a total game changer. And so one of the yeah. things that they want to accomplish is I think they want to do this by 2030. And family, look, if you look at the how quick AI is, is growing by leaps and bounds, it's exponential growth. Uh, once they have this uh, with quantum computing, again, I think it's important for us to keep our eye on this marriage that is so close to happening because it's going to be it's a, it's a game changer on every front. So let me throw this back to Patrick because, you know, we're Bible prophecy guys, I think, first and foremost. Yeah. So where do you, how do you see this all fitting into this beast empire, Babylon, Mark of the Beast, you know, sort of give us your, your ideas uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. You know, I asked this question to, um, they pop, popped the question to uh, Jim Hughes, uh, not Tom, Tom, Tom Hughes. Tom, yeah. <laughs> I know another guy, Jim, Tom Hughes. I asked this question to him. <clears throat> if uh, the devil is going to have a seven year period to do his work, whatever that is, to mount his final rebellion against God. How much time is he going to sp spend building his infrastructure? How much, how much, what slice of that seven, seven per uh, year, year period will the devil allocate to build his infrastructure? Well, none of it. The logic, right. the only way to answer that question, well, not, none of it. He's not going to, sure. he's going to, he's whatever he's going to build to use that. You can't do it seven years. He's going to build it all now. And this is what's, this really is what we're leading up to right now. Right. The system that's getting put, put in place, putting place right now. I don't know how it's going to, how fast it's going to go or whatever, but I'll tell you what, whatever, whatever system that the Antichrist is going to use when he gets in power, it's going to be set by that point That's to do right. everything he needs to do. Yeah. So he's just to, going to flip the to switch. Capture everybody. 
That's well. So he'll just you, the the, the it'll switch be has already go. been <laughs> yeah, right. The, it's already is already is it's going to be ready for him to assume this whole thing. Yeah. Well, uh, I think you know so we 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 got to remember the ten uh, the ten kings too, right? Like you said, Pat, he'll literally just be sitting, and the baton's just going to be passed on to him or taken from the ten kings, and he'll just assume control of it totally. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, there's lots of ways you can look at uh, Revelation, I, I believe. You know, you can, some of it you can speculate on, but the more we know about this technology today and the intent of it, we need, we need to remember that the mindset of it and the, tent, the intent of it now, um, we can see these things coming into the book of Revel revelation almost like uh the uh the the images sh showed the of the woman you know walking along this, the streets of tokyo or wherever um you know you, you can see how this is going to be used but what it, until the antichrist appears that that's the key for Christians at this point, for sure. Where when the ap, uh, rapture will occur, when, when the Antichrist appears from this period to then, we're likely to see all of this stuff in in some form descend on us. Now, we're, we're likely to see it. I can't at this point. I don't see any any reason why it shouldn't. The question for you, you know, the, all the questions that me we need to ask today as Christians. For instance, if you care about the lost and you want to be a witness to them, yep. to communicate with them, how are you going to gen? How are you going to communicate with people who have lost? Uh, sight of reality, who have fallen out of reality, and yeah. now they're living in the matrix, and you can't reach them anymore. You can't, you can't get have a conversation about your where re real reality is and where they are. There's no way, there's no hook to to get their attention. This is a big problem for the church right now. How are we going? How are we going to do this? We need to prepare now. Yeah. It's not that we're not changing the gospel here. I'm sorry. It's, that's not what the gospel is the same then as now and in the future too. But we need to f figure out ways how we, we are going to communicate with people and touch people yeah. with the gospel because that's the only way we're going to save them. The Amen. only way they will be lost. You know, so, so let uh, me ask you the elephant in the room. Forever. It, I had a conversation with a tech company the other day that is using AI to assist churches, not in drafting sermons or everything, <laughs> but sort of splitting things up into bits and bytes and questions to reach people. And I, and I don't know, maybe they have an idea that, you know, they, they, they kind of can determine where people are in their thought process and maybe get that hook, bring the truth to them, but sort of understand that the transmission is through a, another, a method that we may not have used heretofore. I don't know. I I'm struggling with it myself. I mean, look, cause I know that God and the Holy spirit is way above and outside all of this stuff, yeah. but um, you know, I'm, I, it's hard because I see people, totally immersed in different worlds yeah when you're out and about patrick yeah. what do you think yeah yeah <clears throat> well uh, back to the the idea of the mo the movie the matrix um that uh it, most people don't know this but uh that movie uh which uh that was a showcase of uh, a french philosopher's uh take on reality his name was uh, Bouillard, I believe. And he wrote uh, a book called Simulacra. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a big word. Yeah, uh, it's a good word. Uh, people need to put it in their vac- vocabularies. It can be. Uh, I've written. I've written several stories, uh, uh, articles about this. By the way, on technocracy news, uh, in the recent year, recent months. That's after my stroke. By the way, this is where I kind of came up with this. Uh, uh, do, do research and stuff on it. The idea of a simulacrum is that people get divorced re- from reality to the point where they cannot tell what reality is at all, period. We call this a a break, uh, a psychotic break. Actually, that's what psychiatrists say. (laughs) Imagine all the world uh, walking around in, in a psychotic break where they just can't get anything. Uh, about anything it's as like zombies <laughs> almost right. just, and you look you look at people walking down the street today with their phones in, yep. in their hand you wonder is that are we kind of close to that right now well that's probably a picture of what's going to happen but uh uh when when you when a sil when a silima uh, can't the word the word doesn't roll off my tongue very well similaqua is formed it it get, leaves you with the impression that the reality is there for you but it's not there the fact is is not there it's like looking at a, a mirage in a, a desert you see palm trees you see people you know jumping in the water whatever when you get there oh there's nothing there uh there's no reality to it whatsoever um this is what the movie the matrix was all about by the way, go go and look at it again. You'll, yeah. you'll see it. You'll see even even to the point where the um, the in, the Easter egg of this uh, this uh, philo- uh, the philosopher's book and is one of the very scenes, first scenes, and the movie, the first movie. You'll see the book Simulacrum, and uh, the, the, it opens up. The Neo opens up and yep. uh, gives some people a disc or something out of it. But you'll see that that's the that's the tell. That's the tell. That was all that that was all what it was about. Yeah. And you can find that book on the internet. By the way, it's been scanned. You can go read it and stuff. It's, it's a very insightful book. Otherwise, the guy didn't have much to say as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but <laughs> but this idea of the matrix. Uh, and a, a, the concept, the basic concept of a simulacrum is makes a lot of sense today because this is where people are headed today. Yeah. When they when they enter into this state where things look like it could be real, but it's not. And they they, they just they flipped out. They just flipped out into this other reality. So you know this this is where i think is we're headed and it, it, it doesn't really it we don't have to have uh a asi defend uh descent on us not even necessarily at this point a g i sure uh, maybe it'll at some point gonna push us over the edge but um we're almost there for a lot of people right there right now they're almost in that area where they are entering into a similar aka already yeah can i can i jump in here real quick and kind of shift gears a little bit because i would love to get either one of your takes on this whoever wants to go first let me just kind of frame it this way uh going back to quantum computing um it's it's important to so the way a quantum computer works is um like a traditional computer it works on um whether think of an on off switch right an answer is either yes or or no it's it's all work it works off of zeros and ones and a quantum computer the crazy thing is is that within a quantum computer the answer can exist all at the same time so it's on and off all at the same time and that's why the processing speed on a quantum computer is beyond lightning fast so my question and is this When it comes to global powers, I know that there is a race right now to be the first ones to obtain quantum, true quantum computing power. Because the day that whoever 
is able to uh, acquire true quantum computing power, whether it's, I believe, at room temperature, um, encryption will be a thing of the past because a quantum computer will be able to break any kind of encryption, uh, cryptography, really, any kind of encryption in a matter of seconds. No. And so where does that put us on a global level of security, right? Because every government has certain levels of data encryption. I know every iPhone has data encryption, but if we're talking about getting to a point where that no longer exists, a government can now hack another government in a matter of seconds and decrypt all of top secret information, it seems to me that we're headed towards a true one world government where there are, as in the movie Sneakers, I don't know how many people saw that old movie with Robert Redford called Sneakers, too many secrets, right? Sea tech astronomy. Um, there won't be any more. So I'd love to hear what either one of you, Pat, you or John, what is your take? Is, is that something that we're going to, you guys think we're going to morph into? It seems like it. Because uh, with the advent of quantum computing right. and the advent of decryption, mm -hmm. uh, how's that going to work? <clears throat> Go for it, yeah, Patrick. That's interesting. I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't put. Um, I don't uh, stay awake at night uh, thinking about uh, quantum complete computing. I w I track it, however, and uh, I'm very interested in it. It'll play into the scene, I'm sure, at some point. Uh, but right now, we have another. Another some. Uh, we have our hands full to think about the collapse of reality right now because that's the thing that's knocking on our door i i think um having said that <clears throat> um if uh quantum con computing could be s fixed by super a ai algorithms maybe uh someday the super intelligence AI, ASI, maybe it's going to crack the 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 shell on uh, quantum quantum stuff, to where you won't have necessarily uh, handheld quantum computers. <laughs> but, yeah, but uh, there will be enough uh, power in in it uh, to run the entire planet at the same time. Let's, if you look at humanity, the whole world, you look at the world with there's humans on it first. The humans used to communicate with um, snail, snail mail, phone calls, whatever it might be. Uh, then you had the internet uh, came on the whole world as a kind of as a control grid <clears throat> where we had now have this, uh, <clears throat> there's a sophisticated net network Contact, uh, connecting everything. Yeah. Um, Google, and by the way, Google, you you understand, knows everything about you. They don't need to have everything and, and decrypt it. <laughs> they already know about you and everything sure. you've ever done in your life. So now on top of that, you got people, then you have this network, <clears throat> uh, very uh, ubiqu ubiquitous network everywhere. And satis, satellites too, as well as cable and fiber, all that stuff. Then you put on top of this, this artificial, uh, e, e, at least AGI, artificial and uh, general, general intelligence. You put this network on top of the internet. Okay. Now you have a global system of control that you never had before this might this whole network could there might be another other layers beyond that but you get the get the idea that, that when ai is wrapped around the world there's going to have to be a computer at some point that can handle all of that processing power to make sense of sure it, absolutely to make sense of it yeah you can see that happen. That's going to come at some point. Maybe, maybe not yet, but uh, 
it doesn't mean that we're going to be plagued. We're, we will be plagued on this uh, front sooner than that happens. But yeah. all, I'm just saying, theoretically, you, you can kind of see this layer already being formed. So, so where's John? Let me ask real quick. Where, uh, Pat, tie in because, again, with the advent of AGI and possibly, you know, quantum computing in the near future, there's a tie between technocracy and transhumanism, right? We have both of those. They go hand in glove, too. And so how is that going to work out? Mm -hmm. Because a uh, lot of Elon Musk, who is a new technocrat, you've got Sam Altman, but Elon Musk mm -hmm. is at the forefront of all of this. Uh, with Neuralink, they just had their mm -hmm. first clinical trials on Neuralink. Where do you see that going? How do they tie hand in hand? How do they go together? The quest for immortality. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'd like to frame this uh, by quoting Klaus Schwab because it's more, it's easier for people to understand it this way, I think. Klaus Schwab is pushing for this great reset. That's the flip into technocracy. That's the flip into sustainable development, green economy, et cetera, et cetera, where you know you'll own nothing and be happy, right? Yeah. This new this concept of a new order that he's saying we have to flip into it, we have to be have the big reset to reform all of society, all of the economy, all of whatever, shift of ownership away from you and you rent everything. In, in their view, uh, they're, they're, they're building a utopia. They blame us for uh, destroying the earth, the earth today, the world that we know now. They look at us as being the trouble. We're sure. the ones that trouble. We're, we're given a, you know, we, we're not playing ball. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. So they looked at us it gener generally about at, at humans. You know, this is the problem, God. They, the same problem they had in 1934 when they came up with this, this science of social engineering nonsense. The problem is people. Okay, we're going to create this new system. What's the point of putting the old people into this new system? They'll just wreck it again. Yep. You know, they could get the same results they had before. You give them a, a nice place to live, they're going to wreck it. So they can't put all humans into their new system. They need to ma make a new humanity to put them, ma make them suitable to exist within this new system. This is what Klaus Schwab calls the fourth industrial revolution where we will be changed through genetic engineering, through, you know, implantable technologies, et cetera, to where we will become, we will be changed to humans 2.0. So we're suitable to live in human uh, system is you know, civilization 2.0. That's where this this is the merger of technocracy and transhumanism. Yeah, it makes perfect sense if you think about it. If you try and put yourself in his shoes, what the problem is, <laughs> you, you you would get it immediately. Sure, <laughs> that, that it's not a strange thing that we're talking talking about here. They want to create a new world, but the problem is if they just pour all all people into it, they just wreck it. And so, what's the point of trying? They have to create new, new, new humanity to be uh, suitable to this new world, and that's what that's why that's all this genetic engineering of humanity is going. This is where it's taken us now. This is the, and by the way, I've doc, documented this whole genetic manipulation of everything living. I've documented this b before 1992. <laughs> when when yeah. real de janeiro convened to produce all this stuff they also sowed the seeds of uh, massive genetic engineering of everything on earth yeah 
every living thing on earth now is being modified and they intend this they're going to finish the stop this job eventually um so anyway that's that's how i look at the at the merger of both of these we thought maybe 15 years ago that no they're not really separate is you know, separate somehow you know you look at it now you know, nope 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 that it's this is like now perfectly yeah <laughs> Yeah, the easy yeah. bugs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, the, like you said, I'm just putting yes, that up. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And but by the so, way, uh, folks, if let me just tell people to go here. If you haven't had a chance, uh, go to Pat's website, technocracy.news. Technocracy There's a link in the notes below. Okay, cool. Yeah. The, the so, description. Go ahead, John. Sorry. So, so listen, so I thought a lot about this and I've talked a lot about this. And so here's an interesting uh, Daniel has a good question. How is AI going to survive the sealed judgments? Now, my view on the sealed judgments is that the seals open, but the effect of the seals is sort of a crescendo that builds to a, a peak at some point. So I don't think that this is going to destroy the AI is not going to destroy this, or I mean, AI is not going to be destroyed by the sealed judgments. But I do think there's a connection. I, and I've shared this a number of times. I've, by the way, Pierre, Patrick, I've paraphrased your phrase that you had with Tom Hughes in that discussion that, you know, when, when the abomination of desolation takes place, uh, we, we know that this mark of the beast technology appears to come after that event. And it's not like the AI or the false prophet and the Antichrist are going to sit down and say, okay, we need to, we need to cloud fund something to control everybody. You know, so <laughs> let, let's get our act together and start raising capital. They're going to be doing like Sam Altman is doing now, raising, trying to raise seven trillion dollars yeah. to build the infrastructure for all of this. And it was a year, a little over a year ago, I was invited to the Christian Media Summit in Israel by the Israeli government. And I'm sitting in this conference room listening to Jonathan Medved. You can you can find it at the uh, Israel, I think it's the Israel Prime Minister, Israel GPO YouTube channel. And his talk, he's talking about AI and it's going to be great. And we're doing this stuff. And we're doing all this stuff with the Arab countries. And, you know, this is sort of the, everybody was sort of caught up in the rush of the uh, Abraham Accords at the time. And he said, um, <laughs> And then he just made this phrase. He said, this AI is going to be great. We will make the lame walk. That's the exact terms that he used. And then I thought back to the <laughs> Neuralink thing that had just been, and by the way, he said, he mentioned ChatGPT, and I had not heard of it at that time. It had only come out the week before. And he said, this is the most unbelievable thing we've ever seen so far. But this is like little tiny baby steps. This is like, you know, the 10 month old who's walking a little bit and, you know, t teetering around and everything. But when I thought back, take the lame will walk, I went back to the Neuralink intro that had just taken place a few couple weeks before when they were, they had the big thing where they, they were going and the progression that they had in that video introduction was the lame yeah. walk the blind see, the deaf hear. And when I kind of put it in that context, sitting in Jerusalem, it was like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. now I get it. Because that's when when the disciples of John the Baptist went to Jesus. He said, go, go ask him, are you the one we're looking for? And Jesus said, you go back and you tell him that the, blind, the deaf hear, the blind see, the lame walk. It's the same order is the Neuralink introduction. And the the point of it all is that there's like this messianic, false messianic component to all of this stuff that we're, that we're talking about. So I think it's going to happen. And, um, you know, when this, <clears throat> when this happens, you know, it, it's, it's like you mentioned Klaus Schwab, Patrick, you know, he talked mm -hmm. back in Chicago in 2017, and he mentioned it again at the World Government Summit, the exact same phrase, that the fourth industrial revolution will be characterized by the fusion of our 
uh, bio, uh, physical, digital, and biological selves. And he, he says it with that kind of uh, Dr. Demento, you know, phraseology that I can't really uh, uh, imitate. Hmm. And then, so, and I also put up a, a picture of a, a Davos forum that they had seven weeks ago. And it was called Quantum's Black Swan. So these these are the the technocrats of the world talking mm -hmm. about a black swan event. They're they're catching up yeah. with the conspiracy theorists in some respects. <clears throat> but the uh, general manager, the GM of IBM Europe, Middle East, and Africa, Anna Paula uh, As Asis, and I pronounce I apologize if I pronounce her name wrong. <laughs> A S S I S which is kind of an interesting spelling for a last name <laughs> in this context. It's like, um, okay, <laughs> you, you were born for such a time as this. But she said, so the question that was posed to the panel was, is this going to lead to a cyber Armageddon, all this AI stuff? And her answer was yes. But don't worry, we're going to develop, we're already working on developing algorithms to get around it. And so it's it's in the context of everybody. We talk about Bible prophecy and everything because it's very important to us. And you know, we all have different views about how this is all going to work out. But I sort of look at the convergence and the acceleration of all of these different lines of Bible prophecy that are happening right in front of us, and it's it's stunning. And I wish I had a dollar for every Bible prophecy expert guy that I talked to and said that says, <laughs> I never thought I would see this. Well, so the question then becomes, so how much are we going to see before we're out of here? And the answer is at least everything we've seen so far and probably <laughs> a lot more. That's my sort of stocky answer to that. So Patrick, uh, yeah. we can wrap this up whenever I know people might want us to go longer, but kind of tie this into this whole Bible prophecy thing a little bit for us and what, what your thoughts are on, are on that. Yeah. <clears throat> well, there's no doubt that um, people were going to be during the period of the seven year period we're talking about here. Um, we know that people are going to be massive, massively deceived they're going to be people who are literally divorced, uh, divorced from reality. They will be living in a simulacrum, um, not able to tell what's up or down. They will be presented with the idea that the Antichrist is Christ. They'll be convinced of that. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, when uh, people think of the term Antichrist, you don't think about something, somebody come, coming out and smearing the, uh, the image of Christ. No, he comes as Christ, uh, a substitute, as an image of, but it's not him. And if people get convinced that he really is the Christ, huh, they'll do anything to su support that th thought. Completely. That's that's the the image you see at the very end of when M, M uh, when uh, Armageddon takes place. You see all the people in that valley, valley, uh, the valley, and the, the the wars going on at that point. When Christ comes in the air, they level their weapons against him thinking they're going to shoot him out of the sky because in their mind at that point they're going to see whoever that person coming is they're going to see him as satan where they need to sh shoot him out of the sky because he's going to wreck their parade they think the Antichrist is Christ. No, this other guy coming in the sky, that's not who we know is Christ. We're going to shoot him out of the sky. We see, you know, and you say, well, I like to get into people's heads, you know, like what, what would they be thinking at that time? Well, how, how, could, how could they possibly get to that stage? Well, 
is when you look at what happens with when the concept of cell simulacra takes place, you can be convinced of anything at that point that's not true, that, but you, you'll think it is true. They, they'll be, they will be so convinced, all along, and along the way, they'll be, they will be so convinced that this person that they're looking at, that we know now as the Antichrist, they will absolutely believe he is the Christ, period. They might even use the Bible to support it. <laughs> at that point, he's the one. Yeah. He's walking among us now. Yeah. He's the savior of the the man mankind. He's uh, the the end all and all. You know whatever. He's the the miracle worker who feeds everybody. You could just you could see this play out that play it that way. It's really weird. But, um, but it, this is the problem we Jesus. have. This is why I I got alarmed on this, this concept of uh, simulacra after my stroke, especially when I, when I see the possibility of people today slipping into this condition, they're going to be prep they'll be prepped for this time later where they won't be able to get out of it again. In fact, it's going to be at some point, and and when when we talk about um, the the concept of uh, getting a mom, a number, worshiping this beast, and you get a number, and uh, you're going to be able to buy and sell whatever, that's just that's that's just feeding the the loaves to the fishes you know, and fishes to the people. You know this this is just provision, divine provision for those people who are willing to worship the beast. And, and that the context, by the way, of that whole passage is all, all about worship. Who are you going to worship? If, you, if you're willing to worship that Christ, then you'll get the provision provided by the number. Otherwise, you'll be killed. If you're a Christian at that point, if, you're, if you accepted Christ at that point, um, you won't worship, you refuse to worship that Christ, knowing he's the, the false Christ, and you'll be immediately killed. You won't be able to survive in that system at all. So this is, you know, this is this is deep stuff. I, I, I know I'm talking about deep stuff here, Sim, simulacra and simulation. You, 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 yeah, you can you, you can find that by the way for a while. What we're you can, talking about here, Maybe. you can find that on Google Books. Pardon? You can find that and read that on Google Books. I think it's yes, free. you can. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, it it's yes, such exactly. an interesting. I mean, Jesus gave us the antidote. Was you know when when someone says, "Oh, the Christ is here," don't believe him. Yeah. You know, I mean, he he sort of closed off for the true believer that avenue, but it it it's a time of great deception and delusion that we're all, we're not entering. We're already mm -hmm. in it. The question is how much further in it are we going to get? Yeah. Um, and so that's why your, yeah. your advice earlier about being yeah. in the word of God, absolutely and being in community with other believers is extremely vital. For yeah, everyone. absolutely. I agree hundred percent. Yeah. I, um, yeah. I'm just going to jump in here and, and, and say that I'll piggyback off what you said, Pat, that, uh, so Satan is the master counterfeiter. And I think if we look back at everything that we've just talked about, yeah. everything we've just yeah. covered is yeah. what Satan is doing is obviously he wants to counterfeit and he's going to counterfeit the Trinity. He's going to counterfeit God. He's counterfeiting reality. And so you can kind of go down the list yeah. because again, he is the master counterfeiter. And I've said this a billion times. I will continue to say this. In Matthew 24, I believe it's verse 4, Jesus told his disciples, take heed that no one deceives you. That was the very, very first thing that Jesus said was going to be a marker of those days, right? And if we're seeing such massive deception mm -hmm. brewing on a scale we've never seen before, 
I too agree with you and with you, John, as well, that the most important thing that we can do right now is as believers in Christ is to get the word of God, uh, get into the word of God and get the word of God into us, because that is going to be the only way to not be deceived. Because again, we are entering a place of all kinds of deception. Even some folks might say, well, you know what, at least it's not in the church. At least uh, we could we could trust what's coming from the pulpits. We could trust the things that are coming out of the church, which I would say, no, you can't, not anymore. Yeah, there's, there are those rock-solid churches still around, but they're far and few. And even with what's coming out of the churches nowadays, John, you've talked uh, in detail in the past years, I mean, uh, about the heresy coming out of a lot of the churches with the advent, you know, of, of guys like Andy Stanley and et al. So um, this isn't going away anytime soon. I think what we're seeing right now is we're seeing this massive buildup. The pressure cooker, per se, is uh, is brewing, and there's no re- no no pressure release valve that's at the top of that pressure cooker. And um, if if we're not if we're not in the Word of God and uh, we're not like you said in fellowship with one another, and most importantly, I think in fellowship with the Lord, uh, it's crazy what's coming because you won't be able to tell what's real and what's not. You know, and people. Let me just say this: unfortunately, even those within the church uh, aren't focused on the word of God. They're not focused on the Lord. They're, they're just so desensitized, I guess, to the things that, you know, John, you're talking about Pat, the things you talk about, or they just, they're flipping about it. "Ah, No big deal. That doesn't affect me. So who cares? Why should I pay any attention? And that's exactly the place that Satan wants people to be is he wants them to be in this place of indifference. Who cares? It doesn't affect me. I've got my lattes. I got my phone. I got my shows. I got my Tesla. Life's good. And uh, that couldn't be farther from the truth because we're going to be entering a period which is going to blow people's minds. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're not ready for it, you know. So um, we're we're approaching about two hours. We're about approaching two hours. So, Patrick, why don't you kind of tie it up for us and I'll have a few more comments to make about some upcoming things. And by the way, you're doing a uh, conference on free speech, I think, next week that people can register for. There's a link in the notes, the show description. That's right. Yeah. With uh, yeah. Alex to, Newman yeah, and, to, uh, and some Citizens others. for Free Speech. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a exactly. Very, very big. Um, I, would, I would add. Issue. Yeah. So would, go ahead. I would say add to add to the. Uh, yeah, I just add to the comp to the thought of the biblical studies, whatever being being the word. Don't don't think that the word, or, or even even the written word, is doesn't is is not going to be your uh, your magic amulet <laughs> to get out of this stuff. You know, Jesus was careful to make this con this concept stick to the to the. Um, uh, in, in the in the the binds of the apostles and the uh, it's, it's disciples back then, the people or the sheep are able to discern the the voice of the shepherd. That's a little bit deeper than just well. I'm just going to read the Bible. Lots of people read the Bible and right. never hear the the word of the Lord at all, but. The, the idea is that he is our shepherd and we need to hear his voice in a way that not not dis- audible necessarily, but we need to hear his voice speak to us individually. And that's like, okay, that's why you read the word, but that's different a little bit. There's a different sense of it when you're listening to him speaking to you. Yeah. I'll just leave it, leave it at that. Okay, good thoughts. Pablo, you got any final thoughts? Uh, people get ready. <laughs> That's it. I, I quoted that song uh, Crystal Lewis people used to ready. sing. I'm yeah. Song. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful song. People get ready. Jesus is coming. Uh, you, you know, 
uh, it doesn't matter. I'll be honest with, with whoever's listening at the end of the day, what really, really matters is it's not your view on, uh, whether it's pre-tribulationalism, pre-wrath, uh, uh, mid, mid, I, any of those, to me, those don't matter. Sure. You could hold those <laughs> views and I know I, I might get a lot of heat. I think what matters most and what should matter most to anybody is knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, because those issues, though, yeah, we could unfortunately argue pretty heavily about those are peripheral issues. Those are issues that are non-salvific. And uh, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and all of the stuff that Pat talked about, that John talked about, that we brought to the table, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it means nothing. It really doesn't. Um, what's coming uh, What's coming in the near and far future uh, is literally hell on earth. But as I always like to tell people, you don't have to go through that. Why? Because Jesus Christ offered himself as that sacrifice for you and for me so that we, what? Yeah, we wouldn't have to go through that. That's a byproduct. But most importantly, I think it's important to remember that we've sinned against a holy God. And for each and every one of us, it's important to understand that and to to, to surrender ourselves and realize that He is God. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And He is coming back. And uh, at the end of the day, I just want to encourage you, as I'm sure Pat and John would too, is if you haven't called on the name of the Lord to be saved, don't put it off. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Don't say, you know what, I'm going to clean myself up and then I'm going to come. No, just come to Jesus Christ just the way you are. Let him clean you up and surrender your life to him. Call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. I really think it's important that's a decision you don't put off because it's the most important decision you're ever going to make. Right. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks guys. So listen, Amen. folks, I, I want to do more of these. Uh, we did one uh, last week with uh, Bridget and Scott Townsend and Tom Hughes. Uh, I, I have one coming up. I'm not going to stream it live probably because it's going to be at 3 a.m. tomorrow morning. I'm going <laughs> to do an interview with, uh, so I'll post it later with uh, Jonathan Spire, probably one of the leading military Middle East uh, report, uh, geopolitics reporters out there uh, from Israel. A uh, good guy that I've met and become friends with. Uh, and Simon Barrett from, um, Middle East report in the UK on, I think it's on revelation TV is going to help out with that interview. I like to bring somebody else in my way, like Pablo to help. Cause I, <coughs> I just don't want it to be my focus and everything. <laughs> and then next week I'm going to do a talk. I think it's on the sixth. I'll be posting links on my social media. Uh, doctor, uh, with Carl, I always say his name wrong. I'll say tech rib, tech rib, tech rib, uh, tech rib. Tech rib. Carl Tech Rib and Dr. Mike Spalding. And by the way, Dr. Mike uh, Patrick said to say hello to you. So um, so we'll be doing that next Thank week. You. So Thank just you. just look for those things on the FBC YouTube channel. I'll also do a little Q&A with Tom Hughes on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11, no, 1 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m., 10 p.m. It's at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific. So you can watch those on Hope for Our Times. So uh, anyway, everybody, we're going to sign off now. Thanks. Links in the thing below. Register for the free speech conference with Patrick. And I'm going to end the stream and I'm going to talk to Patrick and Pablo off air for just a second. Thanks so much for watching. We really appreciate it.